Grace, mercy, and peace be with you all from God our Creator and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In our Gospel reading today, a man who was looking for the meaning of life was talking to Jesus. They agreed that the most important thing in the world was to love the Lord your God with your whole being and also to love your neighbor as yourself. Then the man asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And in response, Jesus told the story. You may have noticed that he didn't exactly answer the question about who is or is not my neighbor. Instead, Jesus turned the tables to explore who behaved like a good neighbor to the one who was hurting. Here's the story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and left him half dead. On the one hand, we shouldn't be surprised because the guy was on a very bad road. Jerusalem was at the top of the mountain and Jericho was at the bottom. The narrow road wound down the mountain with lots of curves and places to fall off the edge and to be ambushed by thieves who preyed on anyone traveling alone. For that reason, most people traveled that road in a group. If our guy had been maybe a little smarter or maybe a little more patient, he could have joined other people traveling down the mountain, but he chose to go by himself, and, and we know he paid dearly for it. Three men passed by. One was a priest, Jesus said. Now, we expect a priest to help, but he passes by on the other side. Now, why would he do that? Well, there are a number of possible reasons. The wounded man might be dead, and the religious law the priest followed did not allow him to touch a dead body. That's one possibility. Or maybe that priest was headed for some kind of a religious service that he was leading. And believe me, the last thing you would ever want to be as a clergy person is late for worship. I was actually five minutes late for a service at a funeral home once because of a really bad snowstorm, and that was an awful feeling. And it is harder to stop and help, isn't it, when, when you have other important things that you need to be doing? Or he may have feared an ambush. There were obviously robbers in the area. Maybe it was a trap. Maybe the robbers left this man alongside the road to decoy some nice person into helping. In fact, maybe this man wasn't wounded at all. Maybe he is one of the robbers lying in wait for me, the priest might have thought. And plus, there was all the effort involved of helping that person who was so badly wounded. Well, with the wounded man's life at stake, those seem like trivial reasons for passing by on the other side, don't they? But is what he did really so uncommon? Lots of people pass by on the other side. It happens every day in every city, in every community. I've ignored people with those signs asking for help. Maybe you have too. I'm not proud of it, but sometimes it's kind of hard to know where to step in. This is one of those parables that hits us pretty hard if we dare to look at it seriously. Back to the story. Then Jesus said that a Levite came along. A Levite was a priest's assistant. Both were holy men. Perhaps the Levite will stop, but no, he too passes by on the other side, probably for the same kinds of reasons as the priest. But then Jesus said that a Samaritan came along. Now, that doesn't surprise us because we've heard this story a million times, but you can be sure that it surprised Jesus' audience. You see, Jesus had started at the top by introducing the priest. He was the best of the best, highly respected. Then Jesus came down one notch and introduced the Levite, who was also well-respected. If Jesus had followed the storytelling conventions of the time, the next person who came by would have been in the next social notch, a merchant, maybe, who would come by and help in an extraordinarily good way. But Jesus doesn't come down one notch. 
he falls all the way to the bottom of the social scale when he introduces this Samaritan. His audience hated Samaritans. It had to do with their history. So when Jesus introduced the Samaritan into this story, the people were very surprised. They expected nothing good from a Samaritan. Nevertheless, Jesus says, it was the Samaritan who stopped to help the fallen man. He risks being attacked. He gets off his animal and helps the man into his own saddle. By this time, his hands are dirty and his clothing is bloodstained. And then he walks in front, leading the animal that is carrying the wounded man. Keep in mind that important people don't walk. This Samaritan has been riding, but to help the wounded man, he's willing to take on the role of a servant and lead the donkey. And then he went to the trouble of all the rest. He took the wounded man to town, he put him up in an inn, gave the innkeeper quite a lot of money to take care of the man, and he promised to pay him even more on his return journey if it was needed. Now remember, this is a story that Jesus told in response to a question, who is my neighbor? At the end of the story, Jesus asked a question of his own. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the man answered, the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Well, assuming that the Lord wants us also to go and do likewise, let's take a closer look at what the Samaritan did in caring for the stranger. First, he saw the man. He didn't let his eyes slide past the wounded man and glance the other way. He couldn't tell, and he didn't care if the wounded man was an enemy or a friend. He simply saw a fellow human in need. And then he was moved with pity. The Greek word means he was moved to the very depth of his being. He felt the wounded man's pain. And then he did what he could to help. As it turned out, that was quite a bit. If he hadn't been riding a donkey, there was probably no way he could have gotten this man to town. But he was riding, so he could help. He got off his mount and put the wounded man in his own saddle and led him down the road to the nearest inn. He had some money, so he was able to give the innkeeper a generous amount to help. And of course, he was willing to help. He was willing to be inconvenienced. Go and do likewise, Jesus said. I don't think Jesus expects each of us to help everybody because that's impossible, and Jesus doesn't ask us to do impossible things. But he calls each of us to help someone to the best of our ability. So we would do well to pray, Lord, what is possible for me to do today? Who is the neighbor you want me to see? Please show me, Lord. One place to start, of course, is right in front of us each week in the Partners in the Gospel sheet. We are all invited to prayerfully read through it and listen for how the Spirit is calling to us. For instance, this week, is the Lord putting those kids on your heart who will need school supplies in the fall? Or that house that needs building for a family with Habitat for Humanity? Or is the Spirit calling to you about people having surgery who need blood? Or displaced Ukrainians who need everything and who are being helped by our own Lutheran disaster relief? Or our neighbors who are hungry? or the disabled guys at Mission Nursing Home who need a library, or any of a, a, a thousand other things. However you are being called and are responding, on behalf of God's world, I say thank you for all the ways, big and small, that you show your love and mercy. I'd like to share one more example of mercy which, which touched me deeply. 
I was at a funeral three years ago for the mother of a family that's very dear to me. She had an extremely generous heart in many different areas, including this. She absolutely could not pass a homeless person with a sign looking for spare change without stopping and giving the person something. She explained to her family that if even one out of a hundred of the gifts made a difference, it was worth it. So at her funeral, the family passed out to everyone present in that large, packed sanctuary, a pink envelope, her favorite color, containing $5, just a little something to help someone else in her memory. Isn't that beautiful? And I know that I am not the only one who continued the pink envelope tradition in our purses or in our cars to be ready to help in just a small way. This is all no mystery to us, my friends. This is just who we're called to be. As someone has said, I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And what I can do, I will do. Desmond Tutu said it this way, do your little bit of good where you are. It's those little bits of good put together that overwhelm the world. And in closing, when the problems and the violence and the inhumanity of the world seem overwhelming and we seem so small, we may hold on to the wisdom from wise rabbis who around Jesus' time said this, do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. In the name of Jesus, amen.